And you're welcome back to The Pulse. Despite having a huge debt cancellation, about a decade ago, Ghana still loses um, almost 30% of its annual revenue to payments on its external debt alone and is currently under a 17th IMF program hoping to salvage an age-old economic problem debt crisis as we know it. In our latest hotline documentary, joining us is Isaac Kofi uh, of course, takes us on that historical ride tracking Ghana's uh, over six decades of ballooning public debt stock. We're described as not credit worthy. No, no creditors will continue to give us uh, credit lines to, to run the business of government for the nation. And since we had only four years to prove that we could govern, uh, we, we might be worse off than what we inherited. So we decided to go the hippie way. And it worked. Ghana was the second biggest beneficiary of debt relief, literally in the world though this is a list of African countries, in terms of the proportion of your GDP and that's a proportion of how much debt that was you know, forgiven, Ghana was number two on the, on, on the list of African countries at least. So you see that we have huge benefits from HIPIC, more than uh, $6 billion of money was freed up uh, for us. The borrowing came a vicious cycle and Ghana couldn't escape the trap even after debt forgiveness. Ghana discovered oil, and by 2011, the country had started producing and exporting its first barrels of crude oil. I do not want Ghanaians to think that the oil discovery is the end of everything. That is the end of the journey. If anything, it's the beginning of the journey. We want to make sure that we derive the maximum benefit from the oil, but that should not take away attention from the other very important areas, agriculture. No nation can flourish without a strong agricultural base. In January 2011, Ghana was set to become the fastest growing economy in sub-Saharan Africa, as projected by the World Bank, with an end period growth rate of 13.4%. Indeed, Ghana ended 2011 with a growth rate of 14%. By 2015, Ghana's economy was in trouble hobbled by widening current account and budget deficits, rampant inflation, and a depreciating currency. Credit dried up as interest rates rose, and banks' bad loans piled up. Precisely because the structure of the economy explains a lot of the things that you see at the macro level and even at the micro level. So that is fine because essentially we, are, we don't add margins to the uh, primary commodities. And look, the world thrives on margins. To the extent that you are not adding margins, you are not getting value. And therefore, you don't command price in the market. After several considerations, Ghana was back to the IMF seeking a fresh bailout. This was our 16th. But by the time we went to Sinchi and uh, looked at the policies and the rest, we realized, you know, that it was going to be difficult. And then as, you know, was the case, the development partners also decided that you know, they didn't think we could handle this, this program ourselves. Uh, they look to the IMF, which is a lender of last resort. It will be the last time we'll have to go to the IMF again for any such program. This will be the IMF program to end all programs. One target of Ghana's 16th IMF program was to help restore our debt burden to sustainable levels. The 16th IMF program actually failed on one of its objectives, which was to substantially bring down debt. So the 16th IMF program really did not do much in terms of uh, bringing Ghana's debt to a sustainable level. And uh, that's Kofi Ajay's work. Fortunately, he's joining us in the studio uh, just to talk about this uh, very first part that we're witnessing. And Isaac, very striking memories of our ex-presidents and we'll be getting to that point definitely where we'll talk about uh, those who are now in power yeah. but let's start off with the trajectory what did, did this whole journey start off from for for the republic of ghana well it's 66 years now mm -hmm. and we've not been able to solve our own debt crisis ourselves and each time we try solving this we need a certain <clears throat> sorry external force to come in which has always been the IMF. So we've been to the IMF 17 times 
And when we went to the IMF in 2016, which was our 15th, you saw President Mahama saying this was going to be the IMF program that was going to end all IMF programs. So he was certain at that point in time that that was going to be our 16th and the last. <laughs> Right. But you and I are here currently in the studios and we know we are currently under a 17th IMF program and we are probably anticipating an 18th and 19th and then probably a continuous IMF to, to I, I don't know, right. it could be infinite. Mm -hmm. right. But the point is that since independence, we've not been able to solve our own debt crisis ourselves. We've been using this IMF you know, module and methodology and it is not working because right. On the average, it's, it takes us just four years or five years, and we are back to the same trajectory. And we are going to the IMF to, to pick up new loans, go to the IMF shopping mall, and say we want this program, we want the other, this program. Right. And know that the IMF doesn't really impose any program on any government. So right. you go there with your own program. In 2016, Setekwe and his, uh, you know, Mama and Setekwe went there with a program they called the, um, you know, the Homegrown Policy. Right. They went there with that. And now we've gone to the IMF again with what we call the Enhanced Domestic Program, right. which has come with its own haircut. So let's try and see if this will be there. I see. And very often, the believers, once we implement the recommendations coming through this uh, adjustment programs mm. and economic reform, we should be on a track for economic recovery. Scientifically speaking, and looking at the data we have, it does work in terms of economic recovery, but we don't play that role in sustaining that economic recovery. So for instance, the last one we ran, uh, and of course, um, uh, tipping off in 2018, for instance, the data indicates, and clearly uh, the indication is there, that you see very clearly, uh, as, we, as we can uh, see, uh, of course, uh, through the graphs that we have, that indeed our economy picks at some point once we're exiting the IMF program. That's correct? Yeah, of course. So it takes us three years. Mm -hmm. And then we are back again. So that has been the trajectory. Uh, well, uh, when, when we talk about even the history itself, uh, you've been speaking to a number of persons then going into the archives. What, what do you sense? Do you feel that this has become more or less a political matter that, of course, is just part of the rhetoric and politicians take advantage of it and make statements as and when they feel it's convenient? Well, so it looks like as if it's more or less like a fiscal populism where... You know, we have <coughs> beautiful programs, but the political will to carry, you know, these programs through us is always lacking because we've not been able to do it. Right. And that has been the problem. Mm. We have very beautiful programs. We draw nice programs with good outcomes, but we've not been able to do mm. it. As uh, well. and, and in fact, uh, we'll, we'll be getting into the details uh, because uh, as we need to point out clearly, uh, in a few days from now, we'll be bringing you part two uh, of that uh, interaction. And, and while we ready ourselves for that, there's a need for us to first of all look at the trajectory, where we started off from, and where we're heading to. Uh, Isaac will be giving us a sense of um, where we're heading to in terms of what to expect next uh, in this very uh, package. Uh, now you're here with us, of course, many are expecting that part two will highlight uh, where we moved on to as a nation, where, of course, the new Patriotic Party administration came into power. We saw, we saw the trailer yeah, there. Yeah. The vice president pointing out clearly reasons for which he believes we're running an yeah. IMF program. W what are we to expect in the next phase? So the part one is the genesis. Part two is what we call from hero to zero. Mm. Because remember, in 2021, Ghana became the trailblazer where, because of our economic you know, outlook and indicators, mm. we're actually able to get a 0% interest mm -hmm. on a certain euro bond. Right. In 2021, we became a trailblazer where all creditors wanted to give us money. But right now, mm -hmm. we are actually in a situation where we've been kicked out of that um, you know, credit market. Yeah. We can't go back to borrow from the euro bond market. Mm -hmm. But just two, uh, three or uh, four years ago, we were the darling boys mm -hmm. in the euro bond market and everybody wanted to lend to us. So in the part two, mm -hmm. we look at what we call from hero to zero. Right. How Ghana moved from a very vibrant economy with very good indicators mm -hmm. to the point where we had to okay. go and beg 
credit test. And that's why you're calling that uh, a nation that begs. Uh, in fact, we're, we're expecting more of this and it's just the beginning of the series. So let's start that series with uh, international development expert and associate professor of political economy uh, at uh, GIMPA, uh, of course, uh, dealing with matters of international relations at the School of Public Service and Governance. He's also the author of Reinventing Development, uh, Politics of Aid Reforms and Technologies of uh, Governance in Ghana, published by Rutledge in 2016. Professor Lord Malkwe of is my guest, joining us via Zoom. Thank you, sir, for your time. Of course, at the time you were putting up this piece in 2016, Ghana was running a 16th uh, IMF um, program uh, under the Eswal John Dramani Mahama administration. Uh, the promise then, as we've seen through this uh, documentary, is that, well, we're not going to go back to the Britain Woods institutions. But you've tracked that history uh, in your book. Where did, where did it all start off for us? And why uh, would you say uh, is, is that we have that situation where Ghana keeps going back to the International Monetary Fund? Okay. Thank you, Blizzard, and um, good afternoon to you and your viewers. Uh, can, uh, I hope you can hear me clearly. And loud and clear, sir. Yes, so we, we can argue that the whole history of Ghana IMF relations started off in 1966, in May 1966. We went to the IMF for support. Uh, it was a standalone agreement to support the economy, cover instabilities in the economy after the Nkuma years. And we were also to help to support us to advertise certain state owned enterprises. Then, from that period, almost every year, coincidentally around the same month of May, so 66, 67, 68, 69, we were going to the IMF every year for stand, standby or stand alone arrangement to correct anything that we thought was wrong in the economy. Now, remember that you see the IMF and the World Bank, these are liberal institutions. I think that point needs to be underscored. So um, your, your guest or your, your colleague, your studio said earlier that the IMF doesn't impose conditions. Well, even if they don't impose a condition directly, they will do so indirectly because the IMF and the World Bank these are liberal institutions. As a matter of fact, we call them part of the liberal international order that came into being after the Second World War. So they were set up in 1944 at the Bretton Woods Conference by the, by the free world, so to speak, led by America. And the idea was to have a liberal international financial system. So we cannot be kidding ourselves. These are liberal institutions. Therefore, their policies are liberal policies, privatization, downsizing the public sector, et cetera. I remember that from the 1950s to 70s, globally speaking, you have the Keynesian economic system that focused largely on welfare, welfareism, so the welfare state. But that all changed because over time, the institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, together with their major countries, like the United States and UK, began to accept their liberal policy agenda. And so we need to have this discussion in that context, that these are liberal institutions with philosophical and ideological uh, bent towards the, the, the right. Therefore, their policies are policies that will promote liberal agenda. If you compare that to where we were under Kwame Nkrumah, where we were largely state-led, the state was predominant in our economic management. That all changed because when you start going to the IMF and the World Bank for any form of policy, support, then the policies have to be liberal policies. So that, that context is clear. Uh, but while you, you make that clear to us, um, of course, the, the assurance by successive governments, as we've just started seeing, in fact, there, there, there's more in the series, uh, we've discovered that each and every government gives that assurance that we will not return to the IMF. At least that assurance has been given on countless occasions. Uh, we've seen that in the Kufour era, uh, the indication was given uh, during the Mills era, briefly, and then, of course, we're seeing John Mahama who took over and also pledging at the time that we're not going to um, return to the, uh, to the fund. Uh, here we are today, and the story is still the same. Yes, the story is the same because I think more often than not, our policymakers miss out on the political economy. I mean, you don't run countries based solely on econometrics or economic common sense. 
And that is why we can make predictions and say that we are not going to the IMF because we are assuming that everything that happens to the economy is within our control. But if you study political economy, which is the interplay of economic uh, forces or economic policy um, and political actors and political processes, both locally and internationally, then you begin to appreciate why you cannot sit in your country and make very bold claims that we are not going to the end. Because if you look at where we are now, yes, we can have our own internal conversations about mismanagement, corruption, and what have you. But you have to also situate the whole discussion in the broader global context, context where we have challenges coming from the broader global economy, including the COVID, including the war in Ukraine. So the interplay of these local and external factors will have implications for our economy. So yes, you can say you are not going to the IMF, but because you don't have control of some of these forces, you may have to, I mean... Uh, but I mean, why, why make the point? Issues. Yeah, why make the point that we, we may have our own policies, but the, the West, as you're pointing out, would have to dictate to us? Yes, so because the point I'm making is that if you look at the fundamentals of most economies in, in Africa and the global south, they, they, they are dependent largely on the international system in view of the things that we export and things that the things that we import. And you, have, you don't have control over these forces. Yes, it is true that if you look at the behavior of all post-colonial or post-independent government of this country, they've all done some of the bad things in, in their books in terms of economic management. They have overspent. Um, I mean, they, they get less from revenue and spend more in expenditure. So we have not lived within our means. So that's a major issue. There are issues about corruption and mismanagement, money that cannot be accounted for. These are internal problems that bedevil almost every developing country, particularly those in Africa. But the larger point I'm also making is that we need to situate all these internal forces and forces in the broader global economic system. Because if you, if you go back in history, the reason most countries started going to the IMF and the World Bank was the OPEC. OPEC is Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. The OPEC price crisis of the 1970s, 73, starting in 73, where the OPEC countries unilaterally had prices of their commodities. And that destabilized the, the, the market for oil products. And that forced most countries to start looking for means of managing their economic in terms of how to get money to import fuel. And eventually, the debt crisis emerged because most of these countries started to accumulate a lot of debt from getting money from the private financial market. Then we went to the IMF the World Bank for uh, conditionality lending, and that is the beginning of the structure adjustment. Mm. So if you look at it, it is the OPEC oil crisis of the 1970s that actually worsened the plight of most countries and set the tone for the increasing role and influence of the IMF and the World Bank in the economic management of most countries. Uh, let's look at a milestone, for instance, uh, when we got into the Kufo administration. And that was a unique turnaround moment for us. Politically, uh, within the country, it was used against the administration. But the HIPIC program uh, was to see a situation where Ghana would enjoy debt forgiveness. And still, that did not work for us. Yeah, I think we got a lot of windfall from HIPIC. Now, we need to understand HIPIC as debt relief as it was meant to be. HIPIC was not like they are giving you any extra money per se. It's like the money you would have been paying your credit. You are now relieved from paying those monies to them and you should channel those monies to poverty reduction. So that is why one of the conditions for the HIPIC was the ability to have poverty reduction strategy papers, country papers. You need to have that in place as in return for the, the, the debt relief under HIPIC. Now, did we manage that because our debt were literally written off. But we know we got back again to the bad ways of spending beyond our means. And that, again, created a situation where we had to go back to the IMF and the World Bank. So I think consistently, even when we get a debt wiped out in completely, where we have to start from the scratch or from the, the clean slate, we all the bad ways. And, and one of the things that has actually happened in the Fourth Republic in particular, is the, the overrun expenditures during election period. And that is something that every government under the Fourth Republic has done. And that has also worked out. So we see that after election, that the new government 
uh, it begins to look for uh, money from everywhere mm. in order to survive because but of our indiscipline in spending money during election years. Mm. And just before we go, um, in your book, um, Reinventing Development, you, you point out how African leaders have not been resilient enough and taking bold decisions and policy measures that will address uh, the problem from its roots. You, you feel yes. we're still in that situation? Yeah, and we're in that situation largely because we've been caught up in the neoliberal policy agenda. You see, the, so long as you have become dependent on this then you are, the, inner, the ability of you to manage your economy from your own point of view is going to be difficult. I mean, if you've come in from the, the critical side of I mean, scholarship, you look at these institutions and ask the question, whose interests and what interests do they represent? Do they represent the interests of poor countries in terms of management of economy? These are global international forces, and they don't account to us. They, don't, they are not responsible to poor countries. But they are possible and they are possible to their partners. Yes. It's not for it's not for nothing that historically has always provided the World Bank presidency. The World Bank president has the Italian American. Uh, so, so, sorry, that we, we lost you briefly, um, Prof, on the point you're making uh, about accountability. If you could just take that point for us. Briefly. Yes. You see, I'm making the point that these liberal institutions are not accountable to poor countries. They are accountable and responsible to their major financiers, major Western powers. And I'm saying that it's not for nothing that the World Bank is headed almost always by an American citizen or somebody recommended by the American government. First, the, the European who choose the, the director or the head of the IMF. But these are the countries or the regions that control these institutions. And as I said at the beginning, these are liberal international institutions that was part of the liberal international order, mm. the world order that came into being after the Second World War was to be a liberal order in the image of America. And that's how you hear the phrase, the American president is the leader of the free world, the free world. That free there is all about neoliberalism, liberalization of economic and political system. And that's the agenda of the West. So therefore, if you are an African country, you want to be self-sufficient and actually actually mm. forming commerce prediction or Africans managing their own affairs, then you have to begin to find a way that makes you less dependent on these international financial institutions mm. that are controlled by the working public government. All right. Uh, we're grateful uh, for spending some time with us. That's uh, Professor Lord Malko Yavuga, international development expert, joining us with his thoughts on uh, the first phase of a nation that begs. The series continues. And of course, we're set to get some more analysis on that. Thank you for joining us.